If we wanted to figure out the thickness of insulation that would be required to make a boiler room safe for people in case they were to accidentally touch uh, the surface of the insulation and we knew the temperature of the boiler, the way we could do that is by making use of Fourier's law of heat conduction. And so what I'm going to do in this video is introduce this law and also work through an example problem in which we're going to be applying it uh, to a real world real world situation in which you want to know how much insulation you're going to buy in order to make a boiler room safe for your colleagues. And so to begin with, uh, the very first piece of information to understand here is the definition of flux, because you're going to see this time and again as a chemical engineer, and that is that flux defined generically is nothing more than a coefficient times a driving force. And in the case of concentrations, we see this. Uh, we have uh, mass flow or mass flux occurring when you have different concentrations of a particular species within a solution because you'll have um, the species moving from areas of high to low concentration. We're going to see this with heat in this problem where if we have a difference in temper temperature between two points, uh, in, a, in a medium, there's going to be a heat flux between these two points. And we see the same exact stuff with electricity. If there is a potential difference, a driving force, there will be flux. There will be a flow of electrons in the direction uh, in order to um, follow and obey this physical law of nature. And so with this information, what Fourier's law of heat conduction tells us is that Q dot is equivalent to some heat transfer coefficient we call H times a difference in temperature, delta T. And as you take more advanced uh, transport phenomena classes, what you will discuss is that this delta T becomes a temperature gradient if you're dealing with uh, multiple dimensions and uh, you want to get fancier. But for the sake of an introduction, uh, we're going to stick to this, which tells us that the heat flux, again, flux is quantity per area per time. So the units of flux you'll sometimes see as watts per meter squared. And we know that a watt is equivalent to a joule per second. So again, we see how we've got a quantity per area per time amounting to a, our flux term, which in this case is Q dot. And so if we wanted to now work through this example in which we have a boiler running at 300 degrees Celsius and we want to insulate it so that if a worker were to touch the surface of the insulation, they're not going to feel anything hotter than 45 degrees Celsius. And we're also told that the temperature is 25 degrees C with a convective heat transfer coefficient of 13 watts per meter squared Kelvin, as well as a thermal conductivity for our insulation of 0.03 watts per meter per Kelvin. If we neglect curvature, we want to find out how much insulation and what, what specifically what is the thickness of that insulation we're going to want to buy and use in practice to keep our colleagues safe and happy. And so to start this problem, uh, we're going to draw things out. And for me, I like to do these little drawings. Um, we're going to define regions. So we're going to have our boiler. We're also going to have our insulation. And finally, we're going to have the air uh, or the bulk fluid, which is the air in which your colleagues are working and you want to keep them all safe. And so I've defined now three regions, and we were told that the boiler has a temperature of 300 degrees Celsius, and we want the interface between the insulation and the air to be no hotter than 45 degrees Celsius. So we want this boundary right here to be 45 degrees Celsius. And then we were also told that our bulk air has a temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. And so um, when you get into more advanced classes, you'll actually start talking about what these temperature profiles look like inside each one of these media. But we don't need to know that 
uh, if all we're doing is caring about the heat flux. And so um, now that we know that, uh, we will also look at these terms that we were given, specifically the convective heat transfer coefficient of 13 watts per meter squared per Kelvin. This is referring to the transfer of heat between the insulation and the air. And so this H term we were just told was 13 watts per meter squared per Kelvin. And in addition to that, the insulation had a thermal conductivity of 0 0.03 watts per meter per Kelvin. And something I would like to point out here is typically when you're looking at the thermal conductivity of insulation, intuitively, if it's insulation, you want this to be a low number. If this were a high number, it wouldn't be a very good insulator because it's not serving its job very well. Um, so in addition to that, another piece of intuition I have here is that uh, conductivity is the inverse of resistance. So the smaller you make your conductivity, the greater your thermal resistance is, the greater or the harder it's going to be for heat to move through this medium. So the next thing we're going to do here is make use of Fourier's law of heat conduction. This Q dot is equal to H times delta T. And so what we have here is, I'll call this Q2. In another area, I'll call Q1. Q1 describes the heat flux from our insulation to our air. And Q2 we can define because we were given what the convective heat transfer coefficient was. This was equal to our convective heat transfer coefficient times, and I'll call this quantity delta T2, which is equal to 13 watts per meter squared per Kelvin, and then times the quantity, and we're going to have 45 minus 25 degrees C. And note here how even though our units, our dimensions are referring to Kelvin and we have degrees Celsius here, because we're talking about a difference in degrees Celsius, this is equivalent to the difference in degrees Kelvin. So you don't need to necessarily convert to degrees Kelvin in order to save, uh, in order to solve these problems, which will save you some time if you're doing this on an exam. And so if you were to now plug and chug these values into your calculator, what you will find is that Q2 is equal to 260 watts per meter squared. And so what this tells us is that per square meter of exposed insulation, 260 watts of heat are exiting the insulation and moving into the air, the bulk fluid and heating up that room. But for the sake of solving these problems and to make your life a little bit easier, we're gonna assume the room is gonna maintain a constant bulk temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. And so with Q2 established, um, a, a key thing to note here is that if we assume we are operating at a steady state, that in other words, that is to say, um, we're not accumulating heat in one of these regions that the temperature profiles are remaining constant with respect to time. We can still have differences in temperature in our media, but those actual temperature profiles, so if I was to draw uh, a typical temperature profile within these media, these temperature profiles at T1 and T2, we can, if, if that's the case, we can say we're operating at steady state. And if we are operating at steady state, so if we assume steady state, then what we can say is that Q1 is equal to Q2. And so this is a very big thing to get when you're solving this problem. And so if you are able to say that Q1 is equal to Q2, then we can rely again on Fourier's law of heat conduction in order to evaluate the thickness of the insulation required. And so if we now look at Q1, Q1, we were given units of the thermal conductivity of our insulation, K, and uh, the equation we will now use is K over L times delta T1. And 
this should make sense if you look at the dimensions because k, if we look here, k had units of watts per meter per Kelvin and flux has units of quantity per area per time um, and the watts has the quantity per time component but we need this area component so we also need to multiply this by one over meters and that one over meters comes from this dividing by L quantity in this term and then we also have the temperature here or the temperature difference which is just gonna have units of Kelvin and so because our goal is to figure out how thick the insulation uh, should be, we can just evaluate or algebraically rearrange this in terms of L. And so doing that, what we would find is that the length and the length here describes the thickness of your insulation. The length will be equivalent to your thermal conductivity times the difference in temperature divided by the heat flux and we know that Q1 was equivalent to Q2 by making that steady state assumption. If we now plug and chug on these values, we would have 0 0.03, and I'll, you can put in the dimensions, and that's good practice. <laughs> um, and then in this case, our difference in temperature here is going to be 300 minus 45 degrees Celsius and then we're going to be dividing by Q2 uh, which we just evaluated which was 260 and after we put in all these numbers what we find is that we get 0 0.029 meters which is equivalent to 29 millimeters and so this 29 millimeters describes the thickness the required minimum thickness of insulation. And uh, also, I would expect if you were to purchase, if you were purchasing uh, the insulation, the manufacturer is going to be supplying this 0 0.03 term. And a, a key thing to note here is that we have just solved for the minimum thickness of insulation. We would want to buy more insulation than that in order to make sure that we're not going to be breaking some law and get fined for not having enough insulation. So in practice, you're going to want to purchase more than just 29 millimeters of insulation per square meter of your, of your boiler. And so that's going to wrap things up for this video. I hope you guys found it useful and thanks for watching.